Founding Fathers is a strategy game based on the United States Constitutional Convention. This convention took place in 1787 to address problems in governing the United States of America. The result of this convention was the United States Constitution, which is the oldest written constitution still in use by any nation in the world. The goal of the game is to emerge from the convention acknowledged by all as a true father of the constitution duty or contributions to the final document. To put it in gaming terms, you want to get the most victory points. This is a card driven game for between 3 to 5 players. It says it has an approximate play time of 1 to 2 hours on the box, but I'd say 60 to 90 minutes is probably closer to the mark. It's designed by Jason Matthews and Christian Leonard, who are two excellent designers, and it's published by Jolly Roger Games. Let's have a look at Founding Fathers. The board is nicely mounted and represents a large cutaway section of the Philadelphia Independence Hall, which is the location that the convention took place. The board has a victory point track, debate floor, committee room, and a place for the deck of cards. There are three spaces next to the deck of cards which will be available for players to replenish a hand of cards from. This here is the assembly room which is divided into two sections for voting on articles. The two sections are simply the yay side and the nay side. There are 55 cards in the game, one for each delegate that was present at the convention. The cards have the delegate's name, some flavour text, the state in which they are affiliated with and the faction symbol which will be either federalist, anti-federalist, large states or small states. On the back of each card you'll be able to see what state and faction the card belongs to but not who the delegate is. So in regards to some aspects of play, you'll have an idea of what your opponent might be limited in doing or what they might be able to do because you can see the information on the back of his cards. The cards themselves are quite thin and mine are sleeved and I would recommend sleeving the cards. The colours of the cards are quite dark as well and whilst it suits the heritage look of the game and I uh, would say that I'd prefer it that way, it can be quite hard to tell exactly what cards are available and what cards your opponent holds just by looking at them from a distance. These are the influence blocks which are made of wood. They are used to mark a player's influence over votes, debate status and committee room presence. Players only start with three of these but more can be earned as the game progresses. The debate chits are quite thick. They can be won and collected by players who have spoken in debate on the debate floor, and these can see some points awarded at the end of the game. These here are the articles in which players will be voting on, a very thick, very sturdy cardstock. They have text describing the article, but in gameplay it's only the faction symbol that is relevant. The articles are double sided, and on the rear is the same article with the opposite faction symbol. You'll also get some double sided player's aids, and these are really helpful and have more than enough information to help you out during your games. And last but not least, the rulebook. The rulebook is available for download in the Board Game Geek forums, and I highly recommend downloading it and having a look at it because it's very easy to follow. Okay, let's have a brief overview of Founding Fathers. Founding Fathers last for four rounds. The end of a round is triggered when an article either passes or fails in the assembly room. So a round can actually last for several rounds of players turns. There are four ways that can see victory points awarded in this game but there are plenty of ways that they can be maximised and that's where the depth of the game comes from. The first and main way to get victory points will be by casting votes on the winning side of the assembly room. You can also get points by having the most influence in the committee room. You can get them through events on delegate cards, and if you're the leader on the debate track, that may also see some points awarded at the end of the game. In a player's turn, he can do one of four things. He can snub delegates, enact an event, declare a vote, or speak in debate. Let's start with snub delegates. A player will usually have a hand of three delegate cards. To snub delegates, a player may discard any number of cards and replenish his hand of cards from the draw pool. The draw pool is the three cards on the board. Remember, a player can see on the back of the delegate cards the state name and faction icon. So he's going to know what he's getting, but not who he's getting. Okay, next is enacting an event. Each delegate card in a player's hand will have an event associated with it. A player may play a card to the discard pile, and the event takes effect. The events are critical to this game, and just add a lot of depth to the gameplay. I'll touch base on them a little bit later. Next is declaring a vote, which is really the core of the game. To declare a vote, a player can place one or more delegate cards that belong to the same state delegation at one of the tables in the assembly hall. They then place one of their influence tokens on it for reference later on. The track along here is also a reference 
for which states have already voted and whether they voted for or against the article that's in question. State delegations votes, they can be overridden by players, so it is possible for another player to come along and change a state's vote from yay to nay. It doesn't happen all the time, but it can happen. There are also some restrictions on voting with a delegate. Now, an article in the game will pass if it gets 7 votes, and it will fail if it gets 6 votes. When an article passes, the yay side are declared the winners, and the article is placed beside the board with some others. If it fails, then the nay side are declared the winners, and the article is flipped and placed beside the board. When you flip an article, it will show the opposite faction icon that was originally shown. Now, the players on the winning side are going to be awarded some victory points according to the number of delegate cards that they had on the winning side. There's also some bonus points awarded for the delegate cards there that have matching faction icons to the article after it was resolved. The players on the losing side won't always go home empty-handed. In fact, it can be beneficial to try and lose a vote on purpose. You see, each influence token on the losing side will be placed in the committee room. Only the player with the most influence in this room will score points equal to the number of influence he has there. They will also get to place the article in the committee room by the side of the board with the other one, but they can choose to place it as is or flip it to represent its opposite faction icon. This is important because of the debates, so let's move on to the debates. By playing a delegate card from your hand onto the debate track, you place an influence marker onto the corresponding track. For each other card played that displays the same icon, you will move up one more space. Now the leader on a debate track will be awarded a faction chit. At the end of the game, the player with the most chits of a faction is going to be awarded some bonus victory points. How many victory points? Well, that is decided by the number of faction icons displayed on the articles by the side of the board. The more icons displayed there, the more points those chits are going to be worth. So you might be able to see some strategy there as to why you'd want to lose a vote at times, because you might want to flip the article in the committee room just to display more Federalist icons if you had the most Federalist debate chits, for example. That might be of assistance to you. Now, the events on the cards offer a lot of choices. Waiting for the right time to enact an event will usually make a big difference to how beneficial it's going to be to you. The game, I'm sure, can be won strategically by taking the normal routes to victory points, but personally, I like to play the game more tactically by trying to make use of the events that I have available to me. You see, some of the events will reward you with victory points, but the actions you take to get those victory points will also see some points awarded in the normal fashion through debates and votes, etc. For example, there is one event that for the remainder of the round, you gain one point each time you declare a vote on the nay side of the assembly room. Now, this rapidly saw votes change in one of our games. The yay side was well ahead. And that event ended up making the nay side win the assembly room because everyone wanted to go over to the nay side. So that event is best played when you want to see the article flipped in the assembly room to represent the opposite faction icon, which may assist you later on at the end of the game when those points are awarded. But not only that, you're going to get points awarded for the event and also through winning the, uh, winning the vote. And this is what I talked about. The events just add a lot of depth to gameplay. There are other events that will offer completely new ways to obtain victory points, like gain one point for each delegate of the Federalist faction in your hand of cards. So that may change which cards you want to draw from the draw pool. Uh, others will be things like players cannot speak in debate for the remainder of the round, which is great if you're ahead on all four tracks. That would be a great time to play that one, uh, because it would guarantee you a debate chip for all four factions at the end of the round, which would be, which, well, that's going to be a benefit, surely. Uh, there were a few issues I had with the game, other than the card quality and colours, which I've already mentioned. Uh, analysis paralysis was present, and downtime as a result for the other players. But just to clarify, it wasn't every turn that that was happening. Some rounds of play would go quite quick, and others would, you know, you'd have to ask, whose turn is it? So um, that was a bit annoying. And the scoring wasn't very tight in our games. But in saying that, look, those issues may cease to exist after a few more plays of the game, once players get more experience with it and get to know uh, a few strategies and, and some of the events on the cards and how they work and that sort of thing. So that might not be there in a few more games. Uh, and a few more games are not going to be an issue. At the club I attend, we rarely play the same strategy game twice in one night. 
This game was an exception. We did play it twice in one night, and that was surprising to me. I didn't have high expectations of other people wanting to try out this game, because quite honestly, if it wasn't designed by these two, or if I didn't know who they were, and someone else brought it along to the club, I probably would have sat down at another table. Not because the theme is boring or bad, it's just I didn't even know what the convention was or why it was held. The theme prior to getting the game was of no interest to me. I did struggle to teach this game, but it wasn't because of the rule book. The rule book's fine. It was just because I had to learn a bit more than just the rules. I had to do a bit of research on the convention itself to make some of the some of the things in the game make a bit of sense to me. Not a lot of it was, you know, none of this game was intuitive for me. Uh, and needless to say, there were quite a few references made to the rule book in our first game. The second game, there was there were less references. And the game was a lot more fun and ran a lot smoother than the first one. And uh, it also saw players' decisions really open up and, and, and making much more of an impact on how the game played out. And it was just really... it was A lot of people were impressed that I thought would, would not even want to play the game. It was really good. I really do enjoy this game. I'm very happy to have a copy. Uh, just excellent work. It's short, sweet, elegant, offers decisions and gameplay that just begs to be explored. Great game. Thanks for watching another episode of Castelli Reviews, everyone. And I hope to see you all again soon.